Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2024. Welcome to lesson number five, Faith Against All Odds, ready for teaching on May 4. The author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 27. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, As we study your word this week and as we reflect upon the lives of those who gave their lives so long ago, as we look at those who lived through the Reformation and the lessons they can teach us and what your word says about it, we pray that your Holy Spirit will bless us in so many ways. And Lord, we want to know more about what your word tells us. We want to know more about you. But also, Lord, we want to bring our prayers to you. And today I'd like to particularly pray for Ivy Moody from Jamaica and also from Jamaica, Nadine Murray and her family, and Amos Sagodi and Nikita Gibson. Lord, wherever people are listening, I pray that they will be blessed in their influence on the people in their area. And also may they know that you are the God who is always faithful. And as we study your word this week, bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 119 and verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let's read that again, Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. The Protestant reformers had something 21st century people desperately need, a purpose for their lives. In his book, The Empty Self, renowned American psychologist Philip Cushman discusses people who live purposeless lives. Their beliefs are shallow. Little of real significance matters to them, and they have nothing worth dying for, so they have little worth living for. But the men, women and children of the Protestant Reformation were dramatically different. They had an abiding purpose worth living for. What they believed mattered, and they were not willing to compromise their integrity. Their core beliefs were an inseparable part of them. To deny these beliefs was to deny their very identity. In the face of death itself, they had an inner peace. In this week's study, with examples from the Reformation, we will explore how the life-changing teachings of Scripture provide the basis for genuine purpose and true meaning in life. Understanding these eternal truths will prepare us for the final crisis in the great controversy between good and evil. The battle the reformers fought is not yet over, and we have been called to pick up where they left off. We too can discover a God big enough for every challenge we face, a God who gives our lives meaning and purpose as nothing worldly ever could. Study this week's lesson based on chapters 7 to 11 of The Great Controversy to prepare for Sabbath, May 4. Sunday, April 28, God's Word Alone. Read Psalm 119, verses 103, 104, 147, and 162. What was David's attitude toward God's Word? How did this impact the Reformers and how does it influence our lives today? Psalm 119, verse 103 and 104. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. And verse 147. I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. And verse 162, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. The Bible was the foundation of the Reformers' faith and the essence of their teaching. 
They understood that they were handling the inspired Word of God, which lives and abides forever, as it reads in 1 Peter 1.23. They treasured every word. As they read its pages and believed its promises, their faith was strengthened and their courage renewed. So, we read in the Ministry of Healing, page 122, with all the promises of God's Word. In them, He is speaking to us individually, speaking as directly as if we could listen to His voice. It is in these promises that Christ communicates to us His grace and power. They are leaves from that tree which is for the healing of the nations, as it says in Revelation 22, verse 2. Received and assimilated, they are to be the strength of the character, the inspiration and sustenance of the life. Nothing else can have such healing power. Nothing besides can impart the courage and faith which give vital energy to the whole being. End of quote. The scriptures shine joy upon our sorrow, hope upon our discouragement, light upon our darkness. They give direction for our confusion, certainty in our perplexity, strength in our weakness and wisdom in our ignorance. When we meditate upon the word of God and by faith trust its promises, God's life-giving power energizes our entire being physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually. The Reformers saturated their minds with Scripture. They lived by the Word, and many of them died because of the Word. They were not casual, complacent, careless Christians with a superficial devotional life. They knew that without the power of God's Word, they would not withstand the forces of evil arrayed against them. John Wycliffe's passion was to translate the Bible into the English language so that the average person could read and understand it. Because that was illegal, he was tried for his faith, condemned as a heretic, and sentenced to death. At his trial, Wycliffe made an earnest appeal, and this is recorded in The Great Controversy, page 90. With whom, think you, are ye contending? With an old man on the brink of the grave? No, with truth. Truth which is stronger than you and will overcome you. End of quote. Wycliffe's dying words were fulfilled as the light of God's truth dispelled the darkness of the Middle Ages. And so to finish today... In what ways have the scriptures comforted you in times of trial? Monday, April 29, Passing on God's Word Read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6 and 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. What do these passages tell us about the confidence Paul had despite the challenges he faced in proclaiming the truth of God's Word? First of all, 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But... Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place.
The Apostle Paul faced overwhelming odds in his work of spreading the gospel, yet he had the confidence that God's word would eventually triumph for, as he said, we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8. The reformers faced similar trials, yet by faith they remained faithful to God's word. An example of the courage in the face of seemingly overwhelming odds is William Tyndale. Tyndale's greatest desire was to give England an accurate, readable translation of the Bible. He determined to translate the Bible from the original languages and correct some of the errors in Wycliffe's translation about 140 years before. Eventually, Tyndale too was arrested and tried. Many of his Bible translations, which were printed in Worms in Germany, were seized and publicly burned. His trial took place in Belgium in AD 1536. He was condemned on the charge of heresy and sentenced to be burned. His executioners strangled him while they tied him to the stake and then burned his body. His dying words were spoken with zeal in a loud voice and were reported as, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. God miraculously answered Tyndale's prayer. Within four years of his death, four English translations of the Bible were published. In 1611, the King James Version of the Bible was printed and it was largely based on Tyndale's work. The 54 scholars who produced the work drew heavily from Tyndale's earlier English translation. One estimate suggests that the Old Testament of the 1611 King James Bible is 76% Tyndale's translation and the New Testament is 83%. In 2011, the King James Version of the Bible celebrated its 400th anniversary by passing the milestone of one billion Bibles in print. The King James Version has impacted tens of millions of people around the world. Tyndale's sacrifice was well worth it. No matter how difficult it seemed, or how challenging the circumstances were, Tyndale and his Bible-believing colleagues trusted that God was working out everything according to his will. Tyndale's life made a difference for eternity. And so to finish today, read Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 and Revelation 14 verse 13. How do these texts apply to Tyndale's life in a powerful way? First of all, Daniel 12 verse 3, Those who are wise shall shine like the bright of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars for ever and ever. And Revelation 14 verse 13, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours, and their works follow them. Now think about your own life and your impact on others. What encouragement do these texts give regarding the opportunity you have to influence others for eternity? Tuesday, April 30, Enlightened by the Spirit One day, while studying in the university library, Martin Luther came to a turning point in his own life he discovered a Latin copy of the Bible. He never knew before that a book like this even existed. With sheer delight, he read chapter after chapter, verse after verse. He was amazed at the clarity and power of God's Word. As he pored over its pages, the Holy Spirit illuminated his mind. He sensed the guidance of the Holy Spirit as truths obscured by tradition seemed to leap off the pages of Holy Writ. Describing his first experience with the Bible, he wrote, Oh, that God would give me such a book for myself. What principle can we take from the following text regarding how we should interpret the Bible? First of all, John 14, verses 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, 
But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And also John 16, verses 13 to 15. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. And Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What's so powerful in these verses is the assurance that the same Holy Spirit that inspired Bible writers guides us as we read Scripture. He is the divine interpreter of divine truth. Unfortunately, many professed Christians today downplay the supernatural element in the Bible and exaggerate the human element. Since Satan can no longer keep the Bible from us, he does the next best thing. Strip it of its supernatural character, make it merely good literature, or, even worse, an oppressive tool of religion to control the masses. The Reformers saw clearly that the Holy Spirit, not the priests, prelates and popes, was the infallible interpreter of Scripture. There is an interesting exchange recorded between John Knox, the Scottish reformer, and Mary, Queen of Scots, and it's quoted in The Great Controversy, page 251. It comes from The Collected Works of John Knox by David Lang, volume 2, pages 281 and 284. It reads, Said Mary, Ye interpret the Scriptures in one manner, and they, the Roman Catholic teachers, interpret in another. Whom shall I believe, and who shall be judge? Ye shall believe God that plainly speaketh in his word, answered the Reformer. And farther than the word teaches you, ye neither shall believe the one nor the other. The word of God is plain in itself, and if there appear any obscurity in one place... The Holy Ghost, which is never contrary to himself, explains the same more clearly in other places, so that there can remain no doubt, but unto such as obstinately remain ignorant. End of quote. Wednesday, May 1. Christ alone, grace alone. Read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Romans 3, verses 23 and 24, Romans 6, verse 23, and Romans 5, verses 8 to 10. What do these verses teach about the plan of salvation? First of all, Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest anyone should boast. And Romans 3, verses 23 and 24, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And Romans 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Romans chapter 5, verses 8 to 10. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God has provided salvation as a gift. 
His Holy Spirit leads us to accept by faith what Christ has so freely provided through his death on Calvary's cross. Jesus, the divine Son of God, offered his perfect life to atone for our sins. Divine justice demands perfect obedience. Christ's perfect life stands in place of our imperfect lives. The divine law we have broken condemns us to eternal death. The Bible is clear. Through our sinful choices, we have fallen short of God's ideal for our lives. We have sinned. Left to ourselves, we cannot meet the just, righteous demands of a holy God. As a result, we deserve eternal death. But there is good news. The Apostle Paul assures us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We read that in Romans 6.23. It is a gift undeserved. If it were by works, we would not earn it. And if there is any one truth that shines out of the gospel, it is that we cannot earn salvation. Martin Luther and the Protestant reformers discovered Christ and Christ alone as their source of salvation. It was then that Luther began to preach the message of Christ's saving grace. Crowds flocked to hear his heartfelt, life-changing messages. His words were like a drink of cold water in the barren desert of their lives. The people were shackled by the traditions of the medieval church and kept in bondage with centuries-old rituals that provided no spiritual life. Luther's biblical messages touched hearts and lives were changed. As Luther read the New Testament, he was overwhelmed with the goodness of God. He was amazed at God's desire to save all humanity. The popular view taught by church leaders at the time was salvation as partly a human work and partly God's work. Luther discovered that Christ's death on the cross was all sufficient for all humanity. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages this classic piece on page 25. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. End of quote. What a powerful and wonderfully written summary of the gospel, that we could be justified by a righteousness in which we had no share. What a promise. And so, to finish today, if salvation is the work of God in Christ, what role do our good works play in the Christian life? How can we affirm the importance of good works in our experience without making them the foundation of our hope? Thursday, May 2, Obedience, the Fruit of Faith. Read Romans chapter 3, verses 27 to 31, Romans 6, 15 to 18, and Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. What do these verses teach us about salvation through Christ's righteousness alone? Romans 3, beginning at verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. And then Romans 6, beginning at verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? 
But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And Romans 8, beginning at verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. A new wind was blowing through the Christian church in the days of Luther. Tens of thousands of people were taught to look away from their sinful selves and to look to Jesus instead. No doubt these people, looking at themselves and what they were like, saw only things to discourage them. What believer today doesn't have the same experience? That's why we need to look instead to Jesus. God's grace changes us. One day, John Wesley attended a Moravian meeting in London. Wesley sat amazed as he heard Luther's introduction to Romans read. For the first time in his life, he began to understand the gospel. Something stirred within, and he felt strangely drawn to this Christ who had given his life for him. He exclaimed, and this is recorded in The Life of the Reverend John Wesley, page 331, authored by John Whitehead. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. End of quote. Read 1 Peter chapter 2, Verse 2, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Colossians 1, 10, and Ephesians 4, verses 18 to 24. What vital truths do these passages reveal about the Christian life? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And 2 Peter 3, verse 18, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. And Colossians 1, verse 10, That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. And Ephesians 4, verses 18 to 24, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. The Reformers systematically studied the Word to discover more truth, not content with the status quo nor a rigid religious experience with little or no growth, they were constantly yearning to know Christ better. Many Bible-believing Christians in the Middle Ages paid an extremely high price for their commitment. They were tortured, imprisoned, exiled and executed. Their properties were confiscated, their homes burned, their lands ravished and their families persecuted. When they were driven from their homes, they looked for a city whose builder and maker is God, as it says in Hebrews 11 verse 10. When they were tortured, they blessed their tormentors, and when they languished in dark, damp dungeons, they claimed God's promises of a brighter tomorrow. Although their bodies were imprisoned, they were free, free in Christ, free in the truths of his word, free in the hope of his soon return. And so to finish the day, when you look to yourself, what hope of salvation do you have?
Friday, May 3. Further thought. God's faithful servants were not toiling alone. We read this from the Great Controversy, page 208. While principalities and powers and wicked spirits in high places were leagued against them, the Lord did not forsake his people. Could their eyes have been opened, they would have seen as marked evidence of divine presence and aid as was granted to a prophet of old. When Elisha's servant pointed his master to the hostile army surrounding them and cutting off all opportunity for escape, the prophet prayed, Lord, I pray thee, open my eyes, that he may see. 2 Kings 6.17 And lo, the mountain was filled with chariots and horses of fire, the army of heaven stationed to protect the man of God. Thus did angels guard the workers in the cause of the Reformation. End of quote. And then from the following page, page 209, when powerful foes were united to overthrow the Reformed faith and thousands of swords seemed about to be unsheathed against it, Luther wrote, Satan is putting forth his fury, ungodly pontiffs are conspiring, and we are threatened with war. Exhort the people to contend valiantly before the throne of the Lord by faith and prayer, so that our enemies, vanquished by the Spirit of God, may be constrained to peace. Our chief want, our chief labour, is prayer. Let the people know that they are now exposed to the edge of the sword and to the rage of Satan, and let them pray. And that's from Book 10, Chapter 14 of De Boing. Quoted in Ellen White's The Great Controversy, page 209. Justification by faith, the great truth that Luther discovered anew, is the foundation of the gospel, the truth upon which our hope of salvation rests. His hymn, A Mighty Fortress, powerfully articulates the gospel. And this next quote comes from the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal, about number 506. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the God of man's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. How can we explain the balance between grace and law, between faith and good works? 2. Why do you think it is so easy to let our minds slip into legalism? How would you define legalism? Why is it so detrimental to our Christian faith? 3. Are there dangers if the concept of salvation by grace is not rightly understood? Where might that misunderstanding lead? And four, what do some people mean when they use the term cheap grace? Is grace ever cheap? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Letters to the Rich and Famous by Rebecca Ruiz LaGuardia A Spanish housewife read a startling passage that prompted her to embark on a 35-year letter-writing campaign to proclaim Jesus' coming to Spanish royalty, actors and singers, and the late Cuban leader Fidel Castro. The missionary initiative was born when the housewife, my mother, Pilar LaGuardia, read, Men in business life, in high positions of trust, men with large inventive faculties and scientific insight, men of genius, teachers of the gospel whose minds have not been called to the special truths for this time, these should be the first to hear the call. To them the invitation must be given. A quote by Ellen White Christ Object Lesson, page 230. Reading the statement, my mother wondered, how can I, a simple housewife, reach these people? Moments later, she hatched a plan. She would listen to interviews with prominent people on television and the radio and read them in newspapers and magazines. 
she would seek any hint that they were interested in spiritual matters and introduce them to God. My mother found many opportunities. As soon as she heard someone say, I wish I had faith, or I'm agnostic, or I have an emptiness inside, she wrote a letter. My mother has lost count of the number of letters that she has mailed to Spanish presidents and government ministers, bishops, priests, actors, singers, authors, journalists and inmates. In addition to Fidel Castro, recipients include Spanish King Philippe VI and Queen Leticia, Italian tenor Albano Carisi and authors Paolo Colo and José Saramago. She never had trouble finding mailing addresses, even before the internet. Sometimes newspaper articles offered clues. Other times she called television stations and prisons. Many people have responded, Madrid's mayor wrote. I'm reading, to the, conf- I'm reading the Conflict of Ages series and I'm in the chapter, The Awakening in Spain, in The Great Controversy. It's very interesting and I will continue reading. A bishop expressed gratitude for steps to Christ and the conflict of the ages and wrote, May divine mercy do what's needed to bring us light. Another bishop said, I want to study the Bible better and to serve God better. Maybe I need to correct some of my interpretations of the Bible. Isabel, a physician who gave up her career to enter a cloistered convent convent as a nun, kept contact with my mother by phone and mail for months. In her first letter she said, You can send me all the Bible materials you want. So my mother did, and a seed was planted. The results are in God's hands. The important thing is to plant seeds, my mother says. The Lord says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days, as quoted from Ecclesiastics chapter 11 verse 1 in the New King James Version.